Okay, I think the numbers are starting to stabilize now. So there'll be people joining over the next uh, minute or so. Um, my name is Ruchir Shah. I'm the Director of External Affairs for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And I would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar, which is led by the Scottish Wildlife Trust local group in Stirling and Clackmannanshire. Um, in a moment, I'm going to pass over to Liz, who will be able to introduce um, the, the local group, and then we will be moving to our main speaker, Chris Catherine. But if I could just maybe take a moment to say a few things about the webinar itself, so you can get the best interaction possible out of this. So firstly, I just want to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar for public viewing later on. So please be aware of that if you are asking any questions. Second thing is if you have any comments or uh, if you have, if you're struggling with anything, we do have um, Nick Wright, my colleague, who will be checking the chat function. And you can find the chat function by pressing the chat button, which should be there on the screen, at, either at the top or at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free at any point during the webinar to say or to, to write anything that you feel you want to reflect back, any comments any um, observations and so on. Um, and also, so you're aware, if you want to ask any questions to the panelists, um, particularly to Chris, please make sure that you, you click the Q&A button, which is um, on the bottom of your screen as well. And in the Q&A button, you'll be able to ask a question. And please, if you see a question very similar to the one that you're hoping to ask, vote for that one rather than entering your question in there because if uh, a question has more votes it'll rise to the top and it's more likely to be answered. So um, thank you very much again and I'm going to pass over now straight to Liz. Thanks Rishir and hello everybody and welcome to our Scottish Wildlife Trust Stilling and Club Manager group event, our first webinar. Um, I'm Liz and I'm the treasurer for our group. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to tell you a wee bit about our area and about our group, and then to introduce uh, our speaker, Chris. It, it will be a very wee bit, I tell you. Um, the area our group covers is very varied for habitats and for wildlife, much more so than you might think uh, for somewhere that's just a blob on the map in the middle of central Scotland. It goes in the east from the inner part of the fourth estuary below Alloa, up and over the steep scarp of the Ochels, sweeps to the west past Stirling, reaches in the northwest to Cullin and the South Persia Hills, and in the southwest to Strathblane and beyond, by which time you're pretty much in Glasgow. So that gives you an idea of the area. Um, our group is a network of people who enjoy wildlife, enjoy learning more about our local wildlife, and enjoy helping others to learn more about it too. Um, we also work to protect our local wildlife in whatever ways we can. And I'll mention only a few of these ways today. Um, we have three Scottish Wildlife Trust reserves in our area, though we can only work on one of them. And that will sound a bit weird, but the other two are actually within the River Forth itself. They're tidal and they're dangerous to get about on. So we only work on our canvas pools reserve, which is on the north bank of the fort. Um, we do surveying and monitoring of species there and helping with the management of the reserve to improve biodiversity. Um, we help others to learn more about wildlife by, as you know, running a varied programme of winter talks, of which this is one. We also post on Twitter and Facebook, but only, always only about wildlife matters. Um, we run a monitoring group for all the rare plant species in our area, and if the numbers of any of these species is falling, uh, we work to conserve them uh, by, for example, gathering seeds and sowing them and growing them on, or taking cuttings and then planting them out in suitable nearby habitat. Um, we also have a planning team that responds to development and forestry proposals that are worrying for wildlife always aiming to minimise adverse impacts on wildlife and to proactively recommend good practice to the developers or the forest planners. Good practice for wildlife, I mean. We're not always successful in our planning teamwork, but sometimes we do make a significant difference. 
And the last thing I'll mention about the things we do is that we sometimes get involved with campaigning on wildlife issues, usually along with others. Um, and I'll mention here that Stirling Council, in response to recent campaigning by a wide group of people and organisations, including us, um, has decided to review their land management and verge management practices uh, to help pollinators and to reduce pesticide use. So we, are, we still await the details which have not yet been decided, but we really hope that significant progress will be made and it can't come soon enough for our, from our point of view. So on to tonight's business. Uh, our previous chair recently retired uh, and we are very pleased to have recruited a new chair and a vice chair, and you're going to meet both of them this evening, uh, both very knowledgeable on wildlife matters. Uh, Guy Harewood, our new chair, uh, will be looking out during the presentation tonight for your questions and comments via the chat facility, and we'll pick out as many as possible to put to our speaker. So please do use chat to put your comments and questions forward. Um, our new vice chair is Chris Catherine, who is also our speaker tonight. Uh, Chris runs his own ecological cons uh, consultancy company. He's also a trustee for the organization ARC. It's difficult to say that clearly, but it stands for Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, so ARC. Um, and he also actually recently resurrected the Central Scotland ARC group. Uh, and now there's a, a, a group of people running that. So not, not too many of us, I think, know a great deal about these groups of creatures, amphibians and reptiles. So we're very much looking forward uh, tonight uh, to his presentation on the amphibians and reptiles of Scotland. So over to you, Chris. Okay, I'm just going to work out how to share my presentation. Cool. So I, is that working? Can I, uh, people seeing my presentation, thumbs up would be great from Cool. So yeah, I'm Chris Catron. Um, so I'm a trustee for Amphibian and Reptile Groups of the UK, which is a slightly different organisation from Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust, to make sure that's clear. Um, although I support Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust, um, I'm not in any way um, directly connected with them. Um, I am with ARG UK, and I'm also a member of Central Scotland Amphibian and Reptile Group, uh, Centarg, which is the ARG that covers the Stirling and Club Manager area, um, and I'm a member of Clyde Amphibian Reptile Group as well, which covers, um, well, out by Glasgow and Lanarkshire, and also into, I mean, there's an overlap basically between Centarg and Carg in the Loch Lomond and Drottoff National Park, so it's beneficial to be a member of both um, if you like going out there. And I'm also the director of Caledonian Conservation Limited, which is an ecological consultancy based in Scotland. And we do a fair bit of reptile and amphibian work. Um, and I've also been contracted to write uh, reptile and Great Crystal New Guidance in the past. Now, my love of the natural world started with, um, well, some obscure groups, I suppose. Um, so obviously amphibians and reptiles were one of those and spiders and beetles were the others. Um, my grandfather was a miner in the northeast of England and when I used to visit him um, he had a love of the natural world and he would take me out eating and things and looking for reptiles and that's where that all started probably when I was about six and I've been absolutely fascinated by them since. Now before we get into the talk proper I just want to mention this book so The Amphibians and Reptiles of Scotland by Chris McInerney and Pete Minting is a fantastic resource. It's one of the most detailed books on reptiles and amphibians in the UK, let alone Scotland. Um, and it's available for free from Glasgow Natural History Society online. But of course, nothing is better than an actual physical copy of a book, um, which also do exist. I've taken some maps from this um, and used them for distribution in this presentation. So. Amphibians and reptiles. Now, this is a bit of a different experience for me doing a talk like this. I usually try to be very interactive with my audience and that's not so easy to do when there's a couple of hundred of you and I can't see you, um, but we'll do our best. So we have six native amphibians um, in Scotland. We've got a common toad, so I can use my cursor, I suppose. A common toad, natterjack toad, which is very rare, European protected species, palmate newt, smooth newt, Great Crested Newt, and Common Frog. 
Now we have an introduced amphibian as well, the alpine newt, which is very cute, but it shouldn't really be here. And I'll talk a wee bit about each of these animals. We have four native reptile species. We have um, two snakes, the adder and the grass snake. And the grass snake might be our rarest reptile in Scotland. And we also have a common lizard, well, two lizards. We've got common lizard and slow worm. Now, slow worm is a legless lizard that some people may mistake for a snake, but it is indeed a lizard. And again, we've got an introduced species, and this is quite an interesting one. Um, so this is the sand lizard, which is a European protected species in England, but it was introduced to Scotland. And I'll talk a wee bit more about that. But before I talk about anything else, I just want to mention leatherback turtles, because I always forget about them if I don't remind myself to talk about them. Leatherback turtles are a native species to Scotland. They don't breed here, but um, it, Scottish waters are an important foraging area for habitat, uh, for uh, foraging habitat for leatherback turtles. So they breed in the tropics and then the adults migrate here and eat jellyfish. And they're really cool. They're the biggest reptile in the world. They, weigh, they can weigh up to about 900 kilograms, um, about two meters long. They live for 50 years. They can dive a kilometer underwater. They're basically warm blooded. Um, and when they're frightened, they can swim at 22 miles per hour, um, although normally they only go between one and five miles per hour. So very cool animals, not to be forgotten. They're part of our um, Scottish herpetofauna, so our Scottish amphibian and reptiles. All reptiles in Scotland are protected from deliberate and reckless harm, except for the grass snake. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's considered not to be native by um, SNH, Scottish Natural Heritage, or Nature Scots, as they are now known. Um, and sand lizard is fully protected in the UK as a European protected species. But as far as I'm aware, that doesn't apply in Scotland because it's introduced, although it has been suggested to me it may receive the same protection as common lizard. But you would really need to seek clarity on that. And amphibians, great crested newt and natterjack toad are both fully protected as European protected species. So, common frog. I'm not a big fan of common being used in uh, common names for species because it implies that they might be common. common frogs are pretty widespread and common though. Um, and they're found from sea level up to the tops of mountains. Scotland has a fantastic variety of colour forms, probably because of the range of habitats that they occupy. I gather from someone who's doing a study on this that Scotland's more diverse than England in that sense. Um, and they will breed in any, pretty much any water body from a ditch to a pond. Um, and other, some studies have found that their tadpoles can be tolerant to freezing as well, which is pretty cool. Common toad. Now, this is one I'm not so keen on the common part because uh, the common toad is not as common as it used to be and it is declining. Um, and they are not, they, they, they are a lot more picky about where they breed than frogs are. They like to have larger water bodies. Um, and they're really cool. They have these parotenoid glands at the back of the, their head, which produces a toxin that is off putting to predators. Um, although some predators get around that, for instance, otters um, skin them and take their heads off and eat the rest of them. So at breeding season, when toads are going down to ponds, you can sometimes come across the most um, macabre site with all these skinned toads. You can tell frogs and toads apart from their eggs. So this is some frog spawn, it's laid in clumps. And I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but there is some toad spawn here, which is laid in strings, um, and it's often wrapped around vegetation. There's also a frog and two toads in the picture as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into much detail on identification just because of timings and wanting to cover other things, um, but I'm certainly happy to point people in the direction for ID. This is natterjack toad. It's really beautiful. Um, I love their yellow vertebral stripes. Their warts can be really bright red sometimes. Um, and these, these toads breed in um, saline ponds along the Solway coast. Um, and they've really suffered massive declines. Um, because of things like land use change, so um, agricultural use, uh, also management for um, geese can be detrimental to the narjack toads, um, and increasing storms are, um, are destroying their breeding habitat as well. So they're in a bit of a tough place. In fact, um, some 
studies suggest that the breeding population of natterjack toads may be in a worse position than um, wild cats in Scotland. Uh, so yeah, they are they are in need of help. They have lots of careers breeding because of weather in particular. Um, but I was lucky enough to go down a few years ago um, with Pete Minting to do some monitoring. Um, and I found, well, we found these um, natterjack toadlets. So it's it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, some of them do get off and they're really, really gorgeous wee animals. And just to stress, these are um, highly protected. So you can't go looking for them and surveying for them without a license. But there are sometimes, in normal times anyway, organized trips out to listen to them calling by um, uh, Wildlife and Wetland, uh, Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust and RSPB. Moving on to newts. Smooth newt is my favourite newt, um, and I don't see these as often as I see palmate newts or great crested newt in Scotland, um, and that's because they're actually not that common in Scotland. So the other name for a smooth newt is the common newt, and that might be true in England, but it is definitely not true. And they're really beautiful animals, particularly the males. They have this fantastic crest which runs along their back, and it doesn't break at the tail. It goes right away along, to the, along the tail, and they've got these big splodges and their bellies are sort of bright orange red with big black dots. And I, I just love them, They're very cute. Females though are a bit trickier. Um, so female smooth newts look practically identical to female palmate newts. And I've got a picture here which has both in. Um, sometimes it's not too difficult to tell them apart if you get a female smooth newt that's got um, dots on her chin, that's a good giveaway, but they don't always have them. Um, and the key feature is the, the skin itself. So this is the palmate newt here, and it's got translucent skin under its chin, which allows you to see through to the flesh, that pinkish color. The female smooth newt has got opaque skin. So it could be white, it could be creamy, it could be orange, it could be spotty, but the key is it's opaque. Um, and although these, these species have been found to hybridize in the lab, um, they haven't been found to hybridize in the wild very frequently, so it's very likely that you do genuinely have either one or the other. They occupy the same ponds. So, smooth newt is less common than the palmate newt in Scotland, and they like neutral, the slightly alkaline water, which is probably why they're not so common in Scotland. Most of our water is um, acidic to a greater or lesser extent, and so in Scotland they're often associated with quarries due to the underlying rock being um, alkaline space. And their terrestrial habitat, because of course newts don't spend all their time in the water, um, they spend a lot of their time on land, um, and they um, they use woodland, hedgerows, grasslands, and gardens, and so on. They hibernate between September and March. Um, they're, they're in the breeding ponds between March and June, and then they go into this terrestrial phase from June to September, and then juveniles emerge around about July-ish to September time, um, and they sometimes go over the ponds and emerge after in spring. Now the palmate newt could be fairly said to be our common newt um, in Scotland. It's not so common in England. Um, and they're a lot more tolerant of acidic water and they're found from sea level to the tops of mountains. They're really um, very adaptable wee guys. And this is one that I found, we found, well, I was out surveying with another guy and we found a big population of palmate newts just in a flooded field. Uh, it wasn't a pond, it's just a field that happened flooded and they were breeding very successfully there. Um, they're quite variable. The males don't have the big crest that, that the smooth newt does, they've just got a small ridge. Um, and they've got these webbed feet which give them their name and their tails have a filament on the end and there's a few other differences too, but those are kind of the key. And as we've said, the females are, for all intents and purposes, identical until you look underneath uh, the skin. So, Palmate newts are a lot more tolerant of acidity, which is probably why they're successful here. They're also quite hardy. Um, they've been found to breed in um, saline uh, ponds along the seashore in the north of Scotland. Um, and, they're, and they're found in all habitats, basically. Um, they're quite wide ranging as well in terms of um, where they will occupy. They're quite a terrestrial species and they're quite tolerant of dry conditions compared to the other newts. They have a very similar life cycle to the smooth newts, um, perhaps emerging from hibernation a bit earlier and going back to hibernation a bit later. On to the great crested newt, which is the newt that most people probably think of. It's unmistakable compared to the smooth newts. It's so much bigger um, and it's 
almost black in coloration, males and females, they're really dark brown. Um, and they have these warts with little white or yellow tips to them. And the males have this fantastic ragged crest right to the tail and then continues on. Um, and their underside is uh, orange or yellow with dots. And I should say that the undersides of gray crested newts and smooth newts can be used to identify individuals. So you can do population monitoring and things. Um, a great crested newt, just to emphasize, is protected in Scotland. They've got these kind of, this kind of patchy distribution, um, and I guess it's possible I see them more often than smooth newts because people get me out to look for them. Um, but yeah, there's this population up here in the north, which used to be thought to be introduced, but ge relatively recent genetic studies found that, in fact, they, it's co they colonized naturally after the last ice age and have been isolated from most of the other Great crested newt populations in Scotland uh, for most of the time since. Um, so they're becoming genetically distinct. So not only are they not introduced, they're actually probably the most important population of great crested newts that we have here. They prefer neutral to slightly alkaline ponds, but they do breed in acidic ponds. Um, and I recently found a population, a new population that's quite sizable um, in, a, in a bog as part of doing surveys ahead of the peatland restoration. So they've got a tolerance of about pH 4.7 to 8.5. Um, UK work suggests they like pond networks, um, but in the continent, they do tend to occupy larger water bodies. So in Scotland, they certainly do occupy pond networks, but they've been found in larger water bodies by myself and others. And I think David O'Brien wrote a, a, an article on that at some point long ago. Um, and they're often associated with quarries just because of that pH. And in terms of terrestrial habitat, they tend to use broadleaf woodlands and mature hedgerows and grass. Um, they have a very similar life cycle to the other newts. Um, and they have the most amazing larvae. The larvae grow bigger than small newts and they just look incredible. They're otherworldly. And yeah, that's a, that's a chart of their life cycle. And so it's a lot more detailed than just hibernating and hanging out and breeding and whatnot. There's a lot of different stages to a great crest life, and that was prepared for um, some guidance on great crest contract. Now, the alpine newt, as I said, is introduced. There's only a few populations in Scotland, now along here, most of them out in the east um, around Edinburgh and Ratho, but they do seem to be spreading, um, particularly along railway um, embankments. Um, uh, I just noticed that because. Um, people contact me from railway projects and say we found the great crest of newtons in the picture and it's an alpine newt and it's a wee bit further than the last alpine newt someone told me about. Um, so I, I, I would hope someone is monitoring that. And they're very close to the Union Canal now as well and so I kind of wonder if they got into the Union Canal would they spread across um, the whole of the central belt. So, and they're very cute but they're asymptomatic carriers of amphibian disease. So it's not so we don't really want them spreading if we can avoid it. Although the populations have been tested in Scotland and they didn't have diseases that were tested for. So they occupy man-made ponds and quarries, and they could colonize other habitats like islands and, and it's perfectly well. And again, they have a very similar um, life cycle to the other newts, um, but they, they usually emerge slightly later than our native species. In terms of their eggs, it's um, it's effectively impossible to tell small newt and alpine newt eggs apart. They're buff coloured things and they're about the same size. So I don't think that's really possible. At least I wouldn't be confident in doing that. Um, female newts um, lay their eggs surrounded in a, in a sort of adhesive substance that they then um, lay on vegetation and they fold the leaves over with their back legs as protection. Um, and you get, you get this fantastic concertina effect. Um, great crested newts, you can tell apart from the other newts. And some people say you can do so by size. Personally, the size differences I find very difficult to judge myself. Um, but great crested newts tend to be white or yellow or greenish in color. They're generally a coldish color, really. Um, and that's quite distinctive. And the great crested newts, of course, are a lot bigger too, so they can hold it, um, thicker vegetation. Others can't, but they will all use the same. Moving on to reptiles, chart of all of them at once, easier. Um, so 
they have more or less the same pattern. They all hibernate through winter and they emerge during spring and summer. Um, adders emerge slightly earlier than other reptiles do up here. Um, and common lizards go into hibernation a bit sooner, maybe than other reptiles do, but they're broadly the same and there's overlap there. Um, when reptiles are hibernating, so in um, overgrown piles of rubble or um, in dead woods or just old abandoned mammal holes, um, they do sometimes emerge during winter, particularly adders. So if you get a really good day in January, it is possible that an adder might just pop out to do a bit of basking and you can get a photo of it to the snow, um, obviously without disturbing it. So it can be pretty cool. Um, and yeah, during the summer they emerge, they um, molt, they mate, and then they disperse. Um, and then towards the end of summer into autumn, they start coming back towards their traditional hibernation. And you can get quite big communal hibernation sites with all of the different reptiles mixed in. So a common lizard is fairly common it's in terms of its distribution, but it's not that well recorded. Um, and we don't really know how many of them are there are and exactly where they are. And they will occupy habitat from sea level to, I think the highest record I'm aware of is around about 800 meters. So they're, they're pretty adaptable things. Um, they, and certainly in Scotland, they give birth to live young. So they don't depend on egg laying sites and finding a way to maintain their temperature of the eggs. Slow worm um, is a legless lizard and they're fossorial, so they occupy that interface between vegetation and the soil. So they can be quite hard to see, and they're usually hidden. Um, and they tend to bask underneath things as well. So they might bask underneath the rock or underneath vegetation. Um, an exception to that would be gravid females um, towards the end of their gestation will bask in the open to get that. And like the common lizards, they give birth to live young rather than laying eggs. They're avoiding that issue with because we do have relatively cold summers in Scotland. And yeah, that's this kind of well, it shows a, an adult and uh, and a youngster, but it also demonstrates that people often don't know what's there. Um, so th myself and a friend were out looking for reptiles um, in between doing some newt surveys um, in Angus, and we came across some fishermen. And the fisherman said, "Oh, we've been." out here for 40 years and we've never seen any reptiles here. There's none here. And so we lifted a rock that was two meters away from them and they were there. And then we found adders that were about five meters away from them. So reptiles can be hard to see if you don't know how to look for them or you're not looking for them. Sand lizards, as I mentioned, are an introduced species in Scotland. Uh, they're only found on coal and 39 were moved from Dorset to avoid a development before the days of the Wildlife and Countryside Act um, and they were introduced there and they're still breeding and they're still there today. They're in an isolated um, sand dune so there's not really any scope for them to spread. It, it, had they been on Tyree maybe they would have spread all the way around the island um, but they're on call fortunately um, and yeah they are egg laying so they lay their eggs in, in the sand there. Uh, and the, the population is remaining stable, so they're successfully breeding. Um, but coal does receive a lot more sunlight than most of Scotland, um, so it might be a fairly unique situation. It's unlikely they would survive elsewhere, I think. Yeah, that's where they are. I've been out and seen them, um, which is a great privilege. There's also all these uh, short-necked oil beetles, Melobrevipolis, on the same sand dune, which was a species thought to be extinct um, until 2010 when they were rediscovered in the south of England and also on call. And I think it's quite curious that you've got these sand lizards there and all these short-necked oil beetles. Um, I wonder if there's a connection in any way. Um, but yeah, they're not, strictly speaking, protected in Scotland. They're an introduced species. Um, adders. Are, are only venomous snake and they're wonderful. That's actually an adder that was about five meters from those fishermen I mentioned. Um, their, their distribution is scattered and poorly understood. Um, in England, there was a study um, undertaken, um, I think by DEFRA to, um, or Natural England um, under DEFRA, which found that adder populations in England have seriously declined. Um, there hasn't been an equivalent study in Scotland, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. If we look at this map, um, 
the black dots are records um, since 2000 and the um, pink and yellow ones are records from beforehand and they do seem to have been recorded far more widely in Scotland than they are currently. We also have famous black adders um, and anecdotally they occur more often in the north and the west Certainly that's my experience. And there's actually a study that just I think got published uh, maybe a week or two ago, um, which is at, in, on, in Europe, but it's found that adders do in fact um, exhibit more melanism. So they're more black adders and darker stripes um, the further north you go and into areas that don't have as much sunlight. Um, so it stands to reason that that would be the case in the north and west of Scotland. North or at the west coast is cloudier um, thanks to our weather systems. So there's a reason for that and it improves their thermal regulation. Also, it's quite useful for camouflage. There's an adder sitting in some bracken and it does blend in very well until you spot it. Um, although I must stress that adders are found in habitats that don't have bracken. And yeah, it's an adder just peeking out of its hole and it, it's quite good. It shows the a, a good key difference between males and females. So um, this is a male and it's got these um, dark marks between its snout scales, like really, really vivid dark marks and females don't tend to have that. And this is an adder that's mosaic basking. It's down here and it's quite a dark one. It's hard to spot. So they do often bask slightly under vegetation which can make them tricky to see. Scotland has a claim to fame. We had Dr. Norman Morrison known as the Adder Man. Um, he lived out in Lewis and he, he's better known to um, police, I think, because he was a co-founder of the Scottish Police Federation, but natural historians, in particular the herpetologists, should owe him a debt. He, he studied adders in great detail and wrote a fantastic book on their life history. He also looked into folklore and stuff. Um, I wouldn't recommend handling adders. Um, they are venomous. Their fangs can't penetrate like beans or whatever, they're really small. Um, and the venom isn't too dangerous to people unless you're allergic to it. But I do know people who've been bitten by adders and it is a painful experience. Um, and this website, I've left this up. I checked it today and it didn't seem to be working anymore, but I hope it's only down moment briefly or something because it had fantastic resources on this guy's life and work. Grass snakes. So I'm going to talk a, a fair bit about grass snakes. I was trying to think what to focus on in this talk and, I, and it occurred to me that I've given a lot of presentations at conferences um, on grass snakes, but I've not really given a public talk on the, on everything that I've looked at um, in any way. And I would quite like to encourage people to get out there looking for them. Um, and this may not be a bad opportunity to spend some time doing that, depending on how the situation is when we get around to next spring. Um, and just to share some of the stuff that I've done, because I've, I do this voluntarily in my spare time. And I don't have a lot of spare time and I've not got around to publishing some of these things in, uh, in journals or whatever. So there's a good opportunity to share it with people. Anyway, these are, this is the distribution of grass snakes that you would get in the amphibians and reptiles of Scotland, but not a lot of them. And as I've mentioned, um, grass snakes, as far as I'm aware, are considered non-native um, at the moment by Scottish natural heritage. Um, or nature thoughts um, that may have changed. I've not checked recently, um, but I personally don't think we know enough to say they're not native. And if anything, the evidence that I've found as I've looked into it suggests to me that they are probably native in the south of Scotland at least. And yeah, there's, it's been a fair bit of work to try and untangle this. So there's various um, atlases and records, grass snakes in the past. This is an old BR, uh, biological recording center atlas showing grass snakes. This is um, data I pulled off NBN in 2011 when I started doing this. And this is sort of the outcome of in 2013. And that's changed a little bit. Um, so yeah, a lot of different maps you can get. So I'll just quickly run through the picture when I started this, whether talk about whether or not grass snakes can survive in Scotland, have a look at their distribution again, and talk a bit about sources of error, which are applicable to all biological recording. Um, and I think that if some of these can happen with something as distinctive as a grass snake, then they must be happening with other more cryptic species. 
Um, and then I'll talk about the provisional distribution uh, and then possible origins and where we on. I'll talk about the future, what next. Um, but until somebody actually puts some funding into looking into these things, I don't think there's much of a lot. So why did I look into this? Well, in 2010, I was doing Great Crested Newt surveys for Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust and in Dumfries and Galloway, quite near where a place I used to live and run BTCB um, volunteer groups. And I was balancing on a vegetation raft, um, netting for newts, and suddenly a grass snake darted out in front of me and I almost fell in the water and was very glad I brought a health and safety assistant. Um, and this was a big surprise because as far as I was aware, every book I had ever read said that grass snakes don't occur in Scotland. And so I thought I'd ask around. So um, this was at Drumlanrig in Dumfries and Galloway. So I asked the, the Clue Estates and they said that the state workers had reported grass snakes for years, um, but these records when they went further or whatever were discounted because grass snakes don't occur in Scotland. And DGRC, as was, had a record from Angie Andy Riches um, in 2009, which was an absolute definite record. It was just over the border from England, though, so it wasn't massively into Scotland. And that made me wonder if there are any other accurate records out there. So I got the data from the um, BRC Atlas, which is that. And it included a uh, female at Bonner Bridge um, and all the other records were deemed to be escapees. These used to be kept as pets when that used to be accepted. Um, and the expert view today, as I mentioned, was, or at least at that point, was no wild grass snakes in Scotland. Um, and Scottish Biodiversity List technical report lists them as data deficient. So I got NBN data and that's the NBN data. It's more or less the same as the BRC data. Um, and the only additional record was a uh, one from the National Trust, which I wasn't able to get more information on, unfortunately. Um, so before really looking into things further, it's worth looking at the climate, although I should say that this in a kind of backwards way because I looked at climate in far much more detail later on. Um, but according to WWF Wildfinder, which unfortunately got taken down, I think, in 2018, but you can still download the GIS files, um, it suggests that they are here. I suspect that's some kind of um, modeling and broad modeling because they, as far as I'm aware, they're not there. But what, what I did was I got some um, climate data from Estale Muir, which is near where the grass snakes are almost certainly um, in the wild in Scotland and from Delsbo, which is fairly north in Sweden. And that's the most northerly um, breeding grass snake in Sweden, or well breeding. So that's considerably further north. So that's the maximum and minimum temperatures from Estale Muir for about 10 years. Um, and it gives an idea of things. And then that's from Delsbo. And you can see if you take averages, uh, so the red line is S is Estelle Muir and the purple line is Delsbo. The blue line here is the minimum for Estelle Muir and the green one is the minimum for Delsbo. Um, there is there is a quite a difference. Winter is a lot colder in Sweden than it is there in Estelle Muir. And, um, but summer is hotter, um, particularly at the point that grass snakes will be laying their eggs and the eggs will be developing. Um, so there is quite a difference and it, it is beyond the uh, the sort of deviation within the data. Um, so there could be factor there that really needs someone to spend a bit of time with. Yeah. They also need food. There's plenty of that. They eat amphibians and Scotland has a lot of amphibians. They need habitat. They live in Woodland Edge um, and they hunt in freshwater and we've got that. They need hibernation sites, we have plenty of um, And they also need egg laying sites, and that could be a limiting factor. So that's a natural egg laying site from England. Um, so it's in some deadwood. So they're looking for somewhere that's going to keep their eggs at a, a good temperature, um, a steady temperature development. They've also been recorded to, to lay their eggs in peat in 
the east of um, Europe, although there's some um, recent taxonomic changes in terms of species that might make that less relevant. And they also use manure piles and compost heaps, and that's allowed them to um, extend their range quite far north in Sweden, for instance. And we do have a lot of those, and they are present close by pretty much everywhere they've been recorded in the south of Scotland. And they get a higher temperature. So I collected all the records from everywhere I possibly could. And that gave me that, which is 95 records. I've subsequently got more um, from other people. I then tried to verify the records. So I tried to get the original records where I could. I spoke to the recorders. Um, I spoke to local experts to get their view. I looked at maps um, and I looked at the context in terms of habitats and things like that. And yeah, there's the records. Um, there, I found several sources of error. So there were escapees from pets and they tended to be around the central belt, areas of population and Dundee. And so that kind of removed those records being wild or potentially wild. And there were deliberate releases. Um, 200 young grass snakes were released in Loch Lomond sometime before 1990, I found out while talking to people. And records do come in of grass snakes from Loch Lomond and Loch Lomond looks like a great place for grass snakes, but I don't know if those grass snakes are the descendants of the introduced youngsters or if they're wild. Um, and there's, yeah, there's a study in there. So there's a question mark over that one. There are grid reference headers. So one population that almost everyone seemed to think or agreed is probably grass snakes in Scotland wild um, is a population at Langham. But I got the original record and the original record said Windermere. And right enough, if you change the letters at the start of the grid reference, it pops up Windermere. So I don't know how that error perpetuated itself for so long. Um, there are grass snakes around there. I've, there's reliable records of got synth of an established population, but that record is not right. Um, and there are misidentifications, um, undermarked adders and slow worms, and also increasingly introduced species um, or escapees. Rather, they don't survive in the wild. I get a, 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 I get far more records of corn snakes as grass snakes these days. And I get grass snake records in Scotland. It's a bit worrying how many of these seem to be just let loose or escape outside because they can't survive. And also with northern egger moths, there's confusion. But it doesn't look very much like a snake, but their eggs look quite a lot like grass snake eggs and they're a similar size. And so that does re result in confusion. But one of the biggest problems has been common names. So in Scotland, all of these animals are called a grass snake in different parts of the country. And slow worms are called grass snakes practically everywhere. So there's a slow worm being held by renowned herpetologist, Tony Munir. Um, and adders are called grass snakes in Argyll. And grass snakes are called grass snakes too. So common names are tricky things, even for something as uh, distinctive as a grass snake. There's also now a species issue um, because um, the UK grass snakes are now Natrix helvetica um, as a result of findings in a genetic study and a lot of the European ones are Natrix natrix um, and who knows what we have in Scotland depending on co um, colonization events. So yeah those are the common name issues. So the one that was at Bonner Bridge was a slow worm um, and not a grass snake. And there's a bunch of races as well, um, certainly of Natrix Natrix, it's about 15, and there are introduced populations of Natrix Natrix Persa in Yorkshire and also the Newcastle area, so who knows, it might be in Scotland too. And species, as I've mentioned, there's, in the UK it's Natrix Helvetica, but there's been various colonisation events um, to, to the UK and Scotland doesn't always have the same things as England because of that. We sometimes match Scandinavia and Natrix Natrix does occur in Scandinavia. So the only way to find that out would be genetics. And recorders can make, depending on the recorder, there can be a few. The only thing that we really can't do anything about are those without someone doing some genetic studies. So there are confirmed records from reliable recorders that you can say were escapees or releases. So that's those. 
um, there were possible records that made sense in context. Um, and those are those records. And these are some other records that have come in since. And it's quite interesting. We've got these ones like way up here, which are I'm pretty I'm almost certain are grass snake. The photos really are. But these are always young snakes or eggs. So there's possible origins. They could be recent localized introductions via transports of agricultural materials, such as hay, because a lot of hay gets transported from the Tollway and south to the north of Scotland. Um, it could be localized and introduced populations or um, from deliberate releases or pets. They could be a recent colonization event due to climate change, or maybe they could be a more established wild resident present in low densities. Um, to try and work this out or work out how long they've been here, I had a great time chatting with an archaeologist um, called Chris Lynn um, and looking at um, stone carvings from the past and trying to work out if any of them could relate to grass snakes. And unfortunately, there's all these fantastic stones here, um, but they all relate to adders. They all have adder patterns. They all have um, adder eyes and things like that. So there's, we have not been able to find any ancient evidence of grass snakes. The oldest thing I've found is a book by a farmer that's made it over like 100, 150 years old in Dumfries and Galloway, where he describes grass snake eggs on his farm and them hatching out and stuff like that. And he had moved up from England, so he would be familiar with what grass snakes were. Um, so that's the oldest that I've found. They do seem to have been here a while. There's also... Um, transportation of agricultural material um, from the south, which I think could explain the stuff up here, because certainly Hollier is not necessarily the one that that picture was of. Do you transport material up to the far north of the Galway? And so if they were breeding in the hay, then they might end up getting dumped in the north, and that might explain why it's just youngsters and eggs. These ones down here, I think, are probably um, native and they've probably been there for a while. I uh, don't see any reason why the distribution would stop here in the past. So I think there's two most likely, I think those are the two most likely explanations for populations or different records anyway. I doubt that there's um, established populations in the north. Um, but this is just me looking at stuff in my spare time. Somebody could do a much better study, I'm sure. But I would really like any records. Please record things, send photos. Um, targeted surveys would be great. Um, maybe manure heaps to attract grass snakes. That works very well in the north of England where there's low densities. Um, look at the species and race issue with careful recording and photographs and genetic studies would be great. Um, and look at the climate requirements in further detail, I guess, would be a, a useful thing to do. And it would be quite easy to habitat suitability modeling because that's been done for other parts of the UK and it wouldn't be hard to adapt the model to Scotland. Take a bit of expertise and a bit of time and a wee bit of money. There is a recording scheme for grass snakes, which is still live. So please, if you find any grass snakes, go there and record them. And I will love to see those. Loads of people helped me uh, with that stuff. And you can get more information on distribution from my company website or publication download. So yeah, just to remind before I'm just going to talk briefly about threats, um, and I'm just going to remind everybody that reptiles are protected from deliberate and reckless harm, and um, amphibians, great crested utes, and natterjacks anyway are fully protected. Development can be an issue. Obviously, wholesale habitat destruction will. Um, remove habitat, and if there's any animals in it, they will maybe die, it may be killed. Um, sometimes it's necessary to translocate things, so this is translocating some great crest newts out the way of a, a mining operation, and new ponds were created and the newts were moved into them. It was a very interesting experience. Fencing, the one way fencing can stop, it can allow animals to leave the construction site and not re enter, which can be a useful way of doing things, particularly after exclusions. Um, using mats at high densities to try and find reptiles and move them out of the way can be effective. Um, that's a slow worm being moved out of the way that very way um, for a railway embankment job. 
afforestation is an issue in Scotland in particular. When you've got great reptile habitat like that, then, then becomes that. Um, reptiles do not survive well in those conditions. Common lizards might hang on for the longest in the rides, but um, adders don't tend to persist well then. They will recolonize it after clear fell though. Muir burn is an issue. If you imagine birds struggle to get out of the way of this kind of thing, what do you do if you're a snake or, or a lizard, particularly in the cold, cold time of year? Persecution continues in rural areas in Scotland. I don't think that's uh, malicious per se. I think it's a lack of education and awareness. I think people genuinely think adders are very dangerous sometimes. Disease is an issue. Um, so chytrid fungus is causing um, mass uh, amphibian extinctions around the world and is present in the UK. And this um, lovely lady, Alpine Newt, is an asymptomatic carrier of amphibian diseases. Roads um, cause mortality. So this is a, um, a common toad and toads often migrate over roads and frog life and amphibian reptile groups of the UK operate toad patrols to try and them across roads. Here's an adder um, that's between um, Comrie and Braco and it was obviously basking on the road and got run over and that isn't an uncommon issue either sadly. And I've added one for this presentation that I've not had in before which is peatland restoration. So don't get me wrong peatland restoration is great and fantastic and I want more and more of it to happen. But if it's not done sensitively to reptiles, it can result in, well, peatland restoration will almost certainly result in reduced reptiles. That's just going to happen, picking up this area and making it less. But quite, if you don't do it sensitively, reptiles will be killed during the process. So for instance, in this case, there's an adder hibernation site that got dug up in winter. Um, so that will have had an impact on adder. No. But work can be fantastic. This is Flanders Moss now, where there's been amazing peatland restoration work, and it's looking great. And that's great for things like bog sun jumping craters, which are super rare and live on bogs. But peatland restoration is great, but it'd be nice if people took cognizance of reptiles while they were doing it, and they are protected. And part of an issue with that is there's not been, and with development too, is there's not been much guidance for uh, surveying or mitigating reptiles. Um, and there was this fantastic document published in 2011 that was available for a few days before it got withdrawn um, and you can still find it in some places but it isn't um, official guidance anymore. It's a real shame it's very good. There's more vague reptile stuff or vague and unfair. There's other guidance which is great but it's really aimed at volunteers and not at develop for developments and habitat management and that kind of thing and this is a really good one. There's also this Herpetofauna Workers Manual, which was great at the time it was published, but maybe not as detailed as we need now. And people sometimes refer back to this um, guidance document as well, which is really quite old now. And there's been academic studies which have shown that this method is not robust in reptile presence, let alone having any idea what the population is, particularly in places of low density. But there is this, which is aimed particularly at peatland habitats, um, but could be applied in others if you make some um, sensible judgments, if you've got an expert herpetologist, signed up or supported by all of the herp conservation organizations um, and provides good guidance. I, I, say, I, I would say that because I wrote it. So, um, but have a look and judge yourself. There's various charities and ways of getting involved. Um, so there's amphibian reptile groups in the UK, which I um, hear as, and there's local ARGs um, that you can find on the website if you're not from this area, otherwise it's Central Scotland Amphibian Reptile. There's Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust, which tend to focus on sciencey things and conservation, and they can be fantastic to be involved with. They do have a Scottish project at the moment. Um, oh, an SOS Tobago, because you might want to look after those leatherback turtles that use um, Scottish waters and, you know, go on a trip to Tobago and look at the baby purples. I would love to do that right now, but I don't. Um, and Frog Life is also a fantastic um, organization which does some great conservation work and great engagement work. So join your local ARG, get involved with Amphibian Rental Conservation Trust, get involved with Frog Life, record things, and you can also get involved with these specific surveys, which are both to do with snakes, 
Um, there's Make the Adder Count, which is a, a structured survey you can do um, looking at hibernation sites. And there's Saving Scotland Snakes, which, um, which is doing what it pays on the tin. And it's a relatively new one. And yeah, SOS Tobago, you could go there. Um, I mean, Scotland's lovely, but it looks great. So there's links to those various charities. And if this is being recorded, then I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to have a later. For records, send them to your local record centre. But if there isn't one, send them to record pool, please. Um, that data is all um, easily available to everybody. And there's an increasing amount of records. And a reminder of this fantastic book available for free to download. Why would you not do that? Go download it. And there's loads of free publications on my company's website, Cal Living Conservation, including that reptile guidance. And that's me, really. There's a beautiful frog, red one. Um, so I'll pass over to whoever is managing the next thing. That's to me. Cool. That's Right, that's to me. Uh, can I? Am I being heard? I hope. Um, right, so thank you very much, Chris. That was just an amazing uh, whirl around. So much interesting information. Um, I, there's been a lot of uh, questions coming in while that's been going on. So um, I'm going to hand over to Guy now because he's the one who's been trying to pick out themes and the questions and comments. So I'll hand over to Guy now and uh, take it from here. Thanks, Liz, and thanks, Chris, for the talk. There's uh, 22 questions at the moment, so we'll try to get through as many of them as we can, but if we don't get through them all, uh, Chris has agreed to answer them after we finish this talk, and as uh, Ruchia mentioned, the talk has been recorded and you'll be able to access it on the SWT's YouTube channel and that's where you'll find the answers to any questions that we don't have the time to answer this evening. Um, but first up, Chris, there's a question here from Paul Blackburn that says, will letting grass grow long increase the chances of finding frogs in the garden? It'll give them better foraging habitat and better shelter. So I would... Excellent. Um, and Ian Little asks, if you have a pond containing newts, what is the best time of year to clean it of decaying or overgrown vegetation? Question. Um, generally, it would be said to be winter, um, but in Scotland, they do sometimes overwinter in ponds, but it tends to be down the bottom. Um, so I would, yeah. I would suggest doing it with care. And Beth Thompson asks, where do newts go to hibernate? So they'll hibernate in a variety of places. So it might be in dead wood or under um, dead wood, or it could be um, in rubble piles that are partially vegetated. Um, it might be old mammal burrows. Um, basically anywhere that's going to be um, above the maximum water table, ideally, um, unless they've chosen to hibernate in the pond, um, and that maintains moisture and temperature. Um, so they're unlikely to use what people sometimes, and say this goes for reptiles too, the, um, what people sometimes call habitat piles, where lots of cut wood is just kind of piled up. Um, that's not great without also maybe excavating a bit into the ground and putting a bunch of turf on top. There's a question here from Michael Appleby that I'm going to add to because he asks, how did newts find the pond in our garden? And I want to say, because I had a pond in mine and I still don't know how the frogs got there. Um, but he says, coming from several gardens away, including climbing over a one metre wall. In my case, I, I don't know that there's a, a pond anywhere near my garden and the frogs still found it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to the specific garden, but um, they're pretty good dispersers, both frogs and newts. And we, um, I guess, well, it's in my head. If we go to newts, um, newts have a, a they have a terrestrial phase. So when they're in their terrestrial phase, they, their skin changes; it becomes more granular, and their patterning changes. They look, people often confuse them for lizards. Um, they can they can survive 
newts can survive in a terrestrial habitat for ages. Um, they just can't reproduce if they don't have a pond. So it's possible that in areas that they've been traditionally and maybe a pond's been lost, they're still just been hanging on in there and woohoo, you've made a pond, yay. Um, and, they, and they breed again. Um, the, um, with the frogs, um, similar, they're good dispersers. I mean, you never know what holes there are going underneath your walls and things as well. Um, and there have been some, there's been some uh, r recorded incidents of, for instance, ducks having like um, tadpoles or eggs or whatever in their plumage and moving between water bodies and moving things that it's shifting things that way that happens with fish as well as far as i'm aware so that could be an answer to thank you now this question comes from rory age seven jamie age five and charlie age seven what is the difference between a frog and a toad so there are quite a lot of differences um but the ones that are most obvious probably are that um uh, frogs, you can see their eardrum behind their eyes, um, so it's a kind of external. And toads have got these big lumps behind their eyes, which are their toxin glands that, that make them um, poisonous to animals to eat. Um, toads have warty skin, whereas frogs tend to have smooth skin. Um, and um, frogs jump and toads tend to sort of walk or push themselves a bit with a bit of effort. Um, those are probably the easiest ways of telling them apart, I think. David McKenna asked, uh, as he found a common lizard at the Villa Park in Falkirk, um, how common are they? So common lizards, we don't, I mean, the, the genuine answer is we don't know because we don't have the data to work that out. So please record your lizard and it will help us get a better idea of how common they are. Uh, Anna Dozer says, this year, due to low canal traffic in the canal in Falkirk, was teeming with frog spawn and froglets. Will this possible boom in population be picked up in monitoring? And could we ask for less cutting and more wilding of canals? That's a good question. Um, I don't think it'll be picked up in monitoring because there really isn't good structured monitoring of amphibians and reptiles, even to the point we don't really know where they are, let alone how many there are. Um, so you could all contribute to surveys to try and help with that. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one. So I have done surveys for great crested newts along the Union Canal um, and found them to be breeding in some of the disused sort of dead end bits to it. So there's certainly suitable habitat potentially for them. Um, whether or not you would manage to convince uh, canal operators to um, stop cutting is probably the bigger question there. Um, there's no harm asking, uh, but I would imagine there would be some pushback. Amy Kidd has asked, if dark nose patches are used to sex adders, how do you sex the black adders? Great difficulty. <laughs> Getting up close and personal. Yeah, I mean, some different people, some people are more confident in sexing adders than others. Um, and you can you can also sex them by looking at like tail length and stuff. Some people say that the uh, that the how dark the vertebral stripe is can help you. Um, personally, the well, unless I've got an adder in my hand, I do not know how long its tail is. I'm not very good at judging that. And um, the only thing that I find that is reliable to me from a distance is this now mark really own personal confidence. Right, I'm gonna hit you with two questions in one here to keep our uh, technical people in the background on their toes. Um, they're both to do with species ranges and are we, should we expect to see a shift in the range of some species and including grass snakes um, due to climate change, whether that's moving northwards or up in altitude? Um, I don't, well, I don't think we have seen a shift in any reptile or amphibian species in that way in Scotland, but we're also not looking in a, we're not monitoring at a level that we would probably detect that, so I, they, I don't know. Um, I think it's unlikely that climate change is having an impact on the species that we have at this point, um, because they are all quite widely dispersed in Europe. And well, we've got a lot of the species that occupy the most northerly places, but they also do extend further south. 
um, it might be interesting if there may be behavioral changes because certainly reptiles in particular don't tend to behave the same in different parts of Europe as they do here. Um, so that might be something to look out for. Um, and as to the grass snakes, um, it is possible that climate change would allow them to move further north. Um, that seems like a perfectly reasonable suggestion, um, but I don't think there's any way for it. We, I mean, at this point, we don't really have information to know their distribution in Scotland as it is. Um, so it would be difficult to detect, detect a, a change in range. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mike Rutherford's asked, this is interesting, did you hear about a recent report saying pheasants are a major threat to adders? Yes, my friend Nigel was the person who, or Nigel Hand, um, behind that. Yes, so I was, I was going to mention that in my talk, but I felt it might be too much information and it might overrun too much, it probably did already. Um, yeah, I, I think pheasants are a real issue for adders. Um, it's something I've often thought. Um, I used to, when I, in my younger years, I used to um, helped raise pheasants for shoots and things, um, and certainly it didn't seem great then, but um, fe pheasants will, um, will peck adders to death, and it seems that they might actually identify adders on the basis of their zigzag strike to do this, um, which is a great defence mechanism, but I don't think the adders in Scotland entirely understand this, and a lot of pheasants released, um, so it probably is an issue, but it certainly needs further research. Uh, Anne Brackenridge has said, are toes warts the same structure as human warts? Uh, no, um, they're, they're the natural skin structure. Actually. Cool. Lisa Stewart, are there any UK amphibian species that shouldn't be handled due to unpleasant secretions? Well, first of all, I'd say, uh, um, I would say, first of all, generally don't handle wild animals if you can avoid it. And as to unpleasant secretions from amphibians, no, um, but they can get unpleasant secretions from you. Um, so if you're handling amphibians, you should wear appropriate gloves. Uh, another one from Lisa. Could the decrease in the number of adders be related to any decrease in the number of rodents? I guess prey generally. Uh, it could be. Um, that's probably gonna be something that will have a localized effect. Um, I think that may be the case in some places, but I think that habitat changes are probably a bigger impact. Uh, quickly from Lorna Williamson, what the name of the glands on the common toad's head? Parotenoid. I like this question from Penny McKee. Can slow worms go backwards? And what about adders? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, why, why did you class wind farms as a threat to reptiles and amphibians? I don't think I specifically said wind farms. Were. There was a wind farm picture in your development there certain, chat. There's certainly, yeah, that was, yeah. That, that's, so the, that's not specifically a wind farm being a threat. In fact, wind farms can be great habitat for um, reptiles. The black adder photo that I showed is from a wind farm um, in Argyll, um, where they were using the road to Basque. Um, it's just that any development can be a threat to them, particularly during the construction phase. And my experience in Scotland is that that is not often appropriately considered. England are a lot better at that than we are. Um, that was really the point. Um, obviously, if you're doing, um, if you're clearing a whole area for housing, that's probably going to have a bigger impact on a population than, say, doing an underground power cable through the remote parts of Scotland or a wind farm that's got quite a limited footprint. Uh, there's a question from Mel Fox about what does a possible sighting of a grass snake consist of? I think you've touched on it in terms of corn snakes and, and slow yeah. worms. So, so a possible record is, um, so I tried to be quite cautious with verifying the records of grass snakes in Scotland, particularly because the accepted views do not here. Um, so a possible record would be when everything sounds right, um, uh, but it's from maybe a, a person who's not known to the recording community, not known to be a naturalist, um, and maybe, the, well, they don't have a photo or anything like that to demonstrate it. Um, that would be a possible record. And I guess as well, it's not just possible, it's also possible 
um, wild. So those records in the far north of Scotland are, I'm certain pretty much that those are grass snake records from the stuff that people have sent me, but I'm not confident that they're really wild there. I think that it's more likely they've ended up there some. Um, on your distribution map of grass snakes, there were two in the northeast. Is that D side? Yeah, it is. And it's the reason that they're possible is that um, they are independent records of grass snakes in the same catchment um, at about the same time from different people. And I thought that was um, curious. So I'm just reading the. I, I keep thinking we're getting close to the end of the questions and then more keep popping up. Um, but I think we'll get through most of them. How much has COVID impacted on surveys and research? And are some communities less than thrilled to have researchers coming in at this time? Um, so I think it's dependent. So, I mean, there's obviously differences in how COVID-19 has affected things in Scotland compared to England because of different restrictions. So I'll answer for Scotland. Um, and initially at lockdown, all, um, all work had stopped unless it was deemed essential by Scottish government gave the de definitions for that. So most of the survey work that I was doing stopped, but we did have some projects that were deemed essential, so those continued with permission. Um, so for instance, we had a project that was to do with felling commercial forestry um, for uh, biofuel for powering like hospitals being deemed essential. I'm very pleased that they felt that conserving the Great Crest Newts during that project. Um, but there wasn't a lot. And then after things eased a bit, um, there were still restrictions on accommodation. So unless you were a key worker or doing this essential stuff, you couldn't get accommodation. So you couldn't, even a campsite, so you couldn't travel for work very far. Um, and so that was an issue um, uh, for some things. But also my company picked up some work that we wouldn't otherwise get from like say academic studies where traditionally people traveled a long distance to do survey work for something they've been doing for a very long time and they didn't want to lose a year of data so they would come to, to do that this year because we could do it so it's been a it's been a really weird year as i'm sure everybody has found um as to local communities at certainly some more remote communities at the start um, of the COVID thing were a little bit reluctant to have people coming in from the outside or further away, particularly from more populated areas. And I, that's totally understandable. Um, but that seemed to ease off fairly quickly. Um, I'll give you two more questions. Uh, one from David Gibbon. Can I have toads and frogs in my garden pond? And I would say, add newts to that it's it's a question of do the spawns get on do they predate each other um yeah um but all the, yeah there's interactions between the species for sure. um but they uh, um, they eat, i mean they cannibalize each other too you know it's not mm -hmm. just that they're eating is in that regard um amphibians all have a reproductive strategy where they produce a ridiculous number of eggs in the hope that a handful of them make it to adult um so, and in fact, an indicator for a good pond, say if you're doing a good crested newt habitat suitability index, is having the other species of amphibians in the pond already. So, yeah, definitely can have all of them in your pond. And if you do, fantastic. There's a question from Alistair Laidlaw who noted that one of your slides you had corrugated material used as uh, undeforested land, and it says, uh, do you advocate the use of such refugia for amateur surveys? Absolutely. Um, so there's different uh, materials you can use for artificial refugia. Um, there's um, like corrugated iron and there's coralline, which is like a corrugated thing, which uh, isn't as it's not metal, has um, good properties in a similar way. And there's roofing felt and they all have different. There's various studies which have shown which are more effective for different species detection. Um, I, I tend to use, so a combination of different ones is best. I tend to use roofing felt because I can cut that into reasonable sizes that I can put in a rucksack and lug up a hill. Um, where, and that's easier to do than lugging um, coralline or um, corrugated 
steel. Um, but I would stress that um, artificial, so artificial refugia are really, they're really critical for detecting slow worms and felt is best for that, in my view and experience. Other reptiles um, are better detected by somebody who's got experience of spotting reptiles than using felt. Um, felt's just help. Um, and if you are, or felt, or any refugia, and if you are using refugia, um, it's useful to know that um, slow worms will probably be under it. Um, other reptiles might be under it, but they're more likely to be on top of it at the edge, right next to the vegetation, waiting to dart away. Um, so approaching cautiously and with binoculars, checking the egg from a distance. Well, thank you. I've been uh, prompted that that's time. That's the end of the talk. We've got a few questions that we didn't manage to answer, but we will uh, get Chris to provide some short answers to those. And as I say, get them posted up on the YouTube channel. So thanks to Chris for his time and his very interesting talk. Uh, thank you all for attending. Thanks to Liz for chairing and thanks to uh, SWT for hosting and, and setting this talk up. I do hope you enjoyed it and I hope you'll join us for future talks. Thank you. <laughs>